What's this? Depending on how old you are, you might recognize this as a big black box that has no discernible purpose. It might be recognizable as maybe a portable record player, like you do, like just, just put your records on it. Um, it also could be a, a bludgeoning instrument. It's pretty heavy. It's a camera, spoiler alert, and a camera from the 1940s. I'm gonna press a button on the side here. It's a little secret button. Yeah. And I'm gonna press another button back here, which is not a secret. And I'm gonna press a little thing here and pull it out. And it's kind of looking like a camera that we're used to now. There's a lens. There's a place where the photo will actually be recorded. And in this case, there's a, that's our viewfinder. And this camera was made typically, you know, for people in the press. It would have been the kind of camera that if you were a, a paparazzi in 1940 and you're chasing down Frank Sinatra and you want to know what he's up to, and I might not have my timing right, Frank Sinatra might not have been the 40s, you would have this camera. And you'd also have a flash on top of it, you know, so it's, you're able to just blast your subjects with light. And all you do is you go, and then you got your photo. And back then, the photos were roughly this large. This is how big the camera, come, the, the photo comes out of the camera. And back then, this could have been printed directly into a newspaper without reproduction. You could have just taken the photo and just boom, it's in the newspaper. I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying it a bit, but there was no step that needed to be printed and enlarged and all different types of things. So this format was very useful and it's called four by five. Four by five relates to the number of inches that it is uh, tall by wide. One moment. Tall by wide. And in this case, a four by five inch camera has a ton of resolution, meaning it's, it's recording a lot of details for every scene that it photographs. I'm gonna take a moment and show you the difference between a traditional camera that was 35 millimeter, which is small, and a four by five camera, which is bigger. Okay, I'm going to switch to my point of view camera for this. By the way, that's what it looks like. That's our recording setup. We have an iPhone, I have some notes here, uh, and I've got this light box in front of me with the camera. So let's turn the light box on. Awesome. And let's take a look at what we're seeing here. This is a 35 millimeter slide, and this is the 4 by 5 inch slide. As you can see, these are both actual reproductions of, you know, these are literally the same image that they captured. They're not, I didn't have to take a negative and invert it and print it. So the light that was traveling through the camera has recorded onto this film perfectly. And that matters to me. It's not a, it's not a digital interpretation of something. Let's take a look at the difference in resolution here. I'm going to get real close to the 35 millimeter slide. And we might not even be able to see that much, so I'm going to switch, get a, uh, a magnifying glass, put it, I haven't done this yet, so let's see how well it works. Put it right in front, and we can see, hey, it's a pretzel. Well, that's cool. Okay. Let's get a little closer, see what resolution we can discern. All right, well, you know what, we can see enough. Let's take a look at this photo. That's my father and he's taking a Polaroid photo at Cadillac Ranch in Route 66. Yeah, that's a, that's a fine expression, Dad. And uh, in his pocket, which I'll, I'll cut to a different shot, that you can actually see this, there is a receipt for two-inch packing tape from the post office that he visited that day. So that's my short way of saying this image has a lot more detail and information in it than this image. And that's why I really like shooting this size of image because there's just so much to plumb from it. There's so much information and you don't need to know it's there when you record it. You're just like, oh, I got it on four by five. I'll go look at it later and see what I've learned. So 
that's the difference in the sizes. I'm going to take this light box away now. Thank you, Dad. I have some water. This cup says, fa la 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 ma. Okay. So that's nice. So what's up with this camera? What are its features? Well, the main thing this camera has is, hmm, I don't have that answer. To me, its features are that I can record uh, basically anything with it because it's just a light tight box. Let's, let's take a look at this. This is the lens. It pops right off. And here we go. It's got an aperture that you can open or close. That lets more or less light in while this shutter is open. And it's got a variable shutter so you can do different times. So you can do, I'm just leaving it on time exposure right now, which means it's always open. I don't have to hold anything. And if I want, I can change it to one half second, one tenth of a second, all the way down to one four hundredth of a second. And one four hundredth of a second is pretty quick. Humans don't usually notice things that happen at one four hundredth of a second. We're, we're limited to about one tenth of a second or one third of a second. Somewhere between that is our perception of reality at any given moment. I'm going to put the lens back on the camera. And we're going to see if we can create an image on the viewfinder part of it. So let's go back around. Let's open this. Yeah. And so now we have an image on the back. I'm going to adjust the focus knob right here. I'm actually going to do it the faster way. Just move the lens back and forth relative to the film plane, and we will create a focused image. I'm going to point the camera at the llama, I think. And we're going to move it closer. There we go. Oh, now we're getting an image. OK. There's our llama right there. So let's see what happens when we get a little closer. Well, he moved out of focus, but I bet we can fix that by moving the lens closer to him. Him or her, I don't know the gender of this particular llama. They. I am going to hit the llama with a flashlight or a brighter bulb. That will help us because right now we're backlit. I'm just using natural daylight coming in. Okay. Now I'm just moving it back and forth to focus it. And uh, the llama's looking very regal. And I would say, just going to tilt it a little bit. There we go. I would say we have a focused enough image. But I also kind of want the llama's feet to be in the shot. So I'm going to move it back a little bit. There they are. OK. Check the focus again. And the way I'm doing this is not the way a photographer in the 40s would have done it. I'm doing a very different thing. I'm carefully composing an image, carefully composing an image on the back, and then I'm going to record it with a piece of film in the camera. They would have not done that. They would have loaded film in the camera, had it ready to go, and stopped their aperture all the way down to the smallest hole possible. And if they were going to take a photo of anything, they would just make sure they had a flash bulb near the camera that was bright enough to illuminate anything between six feet and 30 feet. Because they're, they're little mini sunbursts when the flash bulbs go off back then. So if you were a press photographer, you never focused your camera. You just kept it at a very small aperture and you just knew that everything was going to be in focus from six feet to 30 feet. So that's why you basically see in the, the movies like, for example, The Aviator, Howard Hughes, Leonardo DiCaprio is walking down a movie, movie premiere runway with like Greta Garbo or someone and these flash bulbs keep going off in his face and he's like, oh, uh, and it's reasonable because they are bright. This, this is one, one one hundredth of the light you would get in a brief moment from a flash bulb. So they were bright and they were fast. Uh, the GE6B bulb that I like to use with this camera lasted for approximately 60 milliseconds, which is not long. Here is slow motion footage of me in my underwear because I did this late at night and there was a test that I only intended for one person to see, doing a slow motion record of exposing a number six GE bulb.
So the first time is real time, it's just pop. The second time is slowed down eight times, and it's more of a whoosh. And then this third time is slowed down 80 times. So you really get a chance to see what the bulb is doing in that 60 millisecond window. Each one of these frames lasts 80 times longer than it actually did when I recorded it. I'm gonna leave this pointed at our llama. That's only just right now so we can see what's going on. We'll take a photo a little bit later with this camera and that photo will actually be reversed. We're gonna let light coming in from the window illuminate a subject over here and flip the camera around. But for this point, I want the light to fall on our subjects so that we can see what I'm talking about. That was a lot of words. I'm gonna turn this, no, it's fine. So yeah, back then they would have just used the F32 setting and they would have just been, oh yeah, it's fine. We're not gonna do that. We want, we want to let as much light into this camera as possible because we are going to take a photo with it with a non-traditional film material. Now I get to segue into the thing I'm most excited about, cyanotype. And cyanotype is just a type, cyanotype is just a type of photographic technique that involves, I don't even know how to describe cyanotype. Cyanotype is a very simple black and white photo, but instead of blacks and whites, you have blues and whites. There we go. This is a film holder. It's the kind of thing that you would actually load film into and then put into the back of the camera, just like that. And once it was loaded with film, you actually wouldn't be able to see into the viewfinder anymore, no matter what, because you just put a big giant occlusion in front of the viewfinder. Now you don't have a viewfinder, you have film that will receive the image. This film holder is empty. We can remedy that by putting a piece of cyanotype paper into it that I sensitized. And the paper I'm using in this case is a piece of this stuff. It's, what is it called? Upo translucent. And I, you can already see on the bottom right hand corner there, I've got some cyanotype material that I spilled onto it. So this is a non-traditional type of cyanotype material and I've coated it with cyanotype. And so now we can load that into the film holder. There's two little guides here, right there, right there, that want to help the film stay there. There we go, close that. Put this back in there. There we are. And then do that. Yeah! So now we have a loaded in uh, magazine a loaded 4x5 film holder that's going to go into the back of this camera. So let's set that aside for now. And by the way, how did this get sensitized? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to show you right now. In a simplified version. We're not going to we're not going to do the whole process. We're not going to do any of the process. I'm going to mime it. I, this is my cameraman. Um, it's a GoPro with hyper smooth enabled. So theoretically, as I'm shaking the camera a little bit, you don't really notice, or you do, and I'm sorry. Okay, if I was going to make a four x five cyanotype on this paper, I would start by opening the paper up, and I would pour equal amounts of these two chemicals, cyanotype part A and cyanotype part B, and you can see the names of them, potassium ferrocyanide and ferric ammonium citrate. Equal amounts of these two go into this tub. And then I take a special brush, which is called a hake brush. In fact, if you wanna see how that's spelled, it's right there, if it's visible. Hake, H-A-K-E. This is a special kind of brush that doesn't use any metal. 
There's a very small, beautiful little wrap of cloth or rope around this, and that allows this to never come into contact with metal while it's interacting with a solution that is metal reactive. So we're basically trying to keep only, only organic, non-metallic things in the cyanotype chemistry. Why, that's why we use this brush. I'm going to pretend there's cyanotype chemistry in here, boo -doo 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 -doo, and then I'm just going to brush it onto this paper. Sound effects are always optional. I like them for demonstration purposes. And then, if this was the cyanotype sheet, I would leave it to dry, come back in maybe a half an hour. Actually, with this paper, I would wait a day. I don't know it very well. I'm trying to let it fully dry before I really use it. And so now we basically know how to make a cyanotype paper that we can load into a camera. How about taking a photo with it? Well, before we do that, Let's take a look at our lens options because this lens is very nice, but it's kind of dim. Like, you know, it's, it's not resolving a lot of information. I can see the, the can there. Hold on. But yeah, there's nothing there in terms of brightness. So let's swap this lens out. And we can do that just by going like this. And there we go, it just comes right out. Let's try a different lens that is wider angle. Now, this one will be an even dimmer image, just because technically I've swapped it for one with a less, uh, less large aperture. And that means they can let less light in on average. But let's see how it looks anyway. Let's open the shutter. Yeah, all right. Okay, well, we got an image. It's, it's there. I'm gonna move the camera closer because this is a wider angle lens. Move the can. I'm gonna, gonna get, get our llama friend close up. Okay, and now let's focus as much as we can. Yeah, that looks nice. And now let's hit it with the light again. This is a soup can. Very useful for a little light scoop. And there we go. See how that looks. All right, I think it looks, I would say fine, but that word isn't great. What about different lenses? Let's say non-traditional lenses. I have answers for that too. This is a non-traditional lens. This is a non-traditional lens. And so is this thing. Let's start uh, and see what we can look with this. So let's swap this lens out. And let's keep looking at the back of the camera. I'm gonna introduce the lens, the magnifying lens. There we go. Okay, are we seeing anything? Yeah, we are. Okay, that looks like the llama's head. I think we're gonna have to move the camera back a little. Let's do this. Hey, there's our llama. That's his little head. And if I move the lens down, we can see probably more of him. It's not the sharpest image. We can actually see a better image of the palm trees outside. I got this lens for a dollar at the Dollar Tree which I like to call China tree. Many products are straight from China. And it's fine, but as an example of quality optics, it's not, it's lacking. Let's swap to this other lens that I got at the Dollar Tree. This lens is a Fresnel lens, and Fresnel lenses are flat. Let's take a look at this a little closer. So this is the Fresnel lens, and you can see it's already magnifying whatever I put it in front of. And it does that because there's a series of concentric circles, very small, but they all act to magnify the things that they are, that light is passing through. And so we'll do that. And there's our, look at, let's see, our, there's our llama friend. Okay, again, this was a Dollar Tree purchase, China tree. I'm gonna push this right there. I'm gonna, I've cut it so that it perfectly fits the square cutout of the camera. And we're just gonna see what kind of results we get. 
with it gingerly placed there. A lot of focusing. Are we going to see an image? I think we're getting something. I think I'm seeing a llama. Okay, I'm going to move back a little bit because this camera and lens combination can't focus as closely. It's not going to fall off the table. There we go. Okay. I think it looks nice. I think he's a, he's a good looking guy. Okay. I know there's a lot of weird contorting going on. If I had uh, a tripod and like an optical bench or something, we would be less bendy, but that's okay. So it looks, again, fine. We're getting an image with our camera. I'm going to do that and I'm gonna flip this around and we will see the difference in image quality change. Let's see here. There we go. Yeah, llama friend, here help. So now we have a, our plastic Fresnel lens. We know what that looks like. Let's swap it for this one. I got this when I was walking by an esthetician and, uh, or an esthetician's office. And I saw right near their, their dumpster, they gently placed one of those big giant, it's got wheels and a long post and then an articulating arm and then this thing surrounded by lights. So um, this lens. I'm going to put it right in front of the camera. We're going to see what happens. Not doing anything fancy, just placing it there. Very, very, uh, okay. I'm going to do this actually. Hey, we're still seeing an image. What is that image? Let's move a little in or out. Looks like we need to move. To get focused on the llama, we're going to need to move the llama. And we're going to need to move the lens. So let's do this. Oh, extension! That's the cool thing about a, a camera like this, is it, it's not limited in the way a traditional 35 millimeter or even a medium format camera is, where they don't have this kind of extension of the lens until the film plane. They're usually fixed, and you're counting on the lens, the length of the lens, to determine how the focal length works. But with a large format camera, it's effectively a variable focal length depending on what lens you put in front of it. So let's put this big honking thing in front of it. Oh, lovely. Hi, llama. Okay, let's move it a little bit closer. And let's do this. Moving it back, looks like it moves out of focus. Let's move it forward. Oh, there we go, okay. Let's move it back a little bit more though, because I kind of want to see the llama's feet. I like his little feet, the, the mug feet. We're not gonna get sharp focus with this because this lens is, is well, it's doing all sorts of things. There we go. I would say, well, let's look at it this way. No, that's not quite going to work. See, now I've actually got it inopportune in an in a unideal way. I'm, I'm kind of tilting it a little bit, but I can actually tilt the lens to compensate. That's the other cool thing is this actually, this lens board can pivot on its own self. So I'm just going to open this up a little bit and then adjust it. Oh yeah, it looks like, oh, it only goes, it only goes the opposite way that I need. That's okay. If the world was perfect for me, then everyone else would probably not love it as much. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hello, llama. I'm asking for trouble with this. Okay. 
oh, you know what, real quick, another fun thing about these cameras is since the image on the back of it is, is inverted, you'll notice it's upside down, when you look through a traditional camera, that's usually compensated for um, by either a digital mechanism, like it's just saying, oh, I know what cameras do, they need to flip the image for the person to understand what they're looking at. Digital cameras flip it for you. Uh, 35 millimeter SLRs have this thing called a pentaprism, which is basically this big five pointed thing that bounces light the right number of times to make it back to your eye in the proper orientation. Uh, medium format cameras often have just a range finder, so you just see a viewfinder on the side of the camera that shows you what you're looking at, and you have to do an approximation for what the lens would see. There's all different ways to have fun with cameras. And I'm gonna have a little sip of water. Thank you, John Blah. There we go. Hi, yeah, you look so regal. We've basically got our image. Now it's time to flip things around because I want the sun that's coming in right from this window, and it's a cloudy day, to come in and wash the subject. So I'm gonna flip this around now. Move this, move this, camera, llama. Yeah, look at that big, big old lens. Okay, just like that. Ooh, neat! I can see all the way through to the ground glass, and there's my there's my hand kind of interacting with it. So let's do that. Move the move llama friend a little further back, and there we go. That's all good. Let's take a look at this focus again. There we are. So there's our llama, he's relatively focused, all the way over there. And you'll notice, again, he's, he's, upside, he's right side up in real life by our eye's perception. And then on the screen here, oh, he's upside down. So now, it's just time to load the camera. Let's take our loaded cyanotype sheet, here we are, which I've put in here, here we are, and let's load it into the back of the camera. Which means we have to close the back of the camera up. Well, that's fine. This just came right off. Now we have it easier. Okay, so we got that side facing out to the camera. Open this up, there we go. And then the important part is, take the dark slide out. That's protecting the light from exposing it until you're ready. Now the dark slide's out. That is now recording, and we've got it. I'm gonna do one thing, which is to tape it. Just a little bit of tape is, I think, gonna make a big difference. Remember when people used to have a video camera, which recorded on videotape, and they would say, did you tape something? Well, we're using film cameras and we're still taping things. And this is a very, this is a very quickly implemented test. There we go, Gorilla Tape, giant magnifying lens, mom. Time, let's leave it running. Well, let me make sure, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do one more thing. I'm gonna open the back of this camera up again because our exposure is just barely, it's only just begun to record. So let's take this out, because we can. Cyanotype material is very slow. And let's check our focus again. Our focus is just fine. There we go. Okay, and put this right back in there. Okay. Now our camera is recording our llama. Um, our camera 
is recording our host, our GoPro is recording everything else, and let me take a look at my notes. Can we make an image with it on cyanotype paper? Yes, we can. Okay, now it's time to just open the blinds. So let's go do that. Watch how bright it gets in the room when I open these. There we go. Maybe I oversold that. But now we have an image that's recording with brighter, better and brighter light. Now, I mentioned that it was a cloudy day. It's really cloudy. I mean, this is, this is San Diego clouds, so they might be all day. We don't get them that often, so we enjoy them when they're here. It's a good day today to do a long exposure cyanotype because if I'd risked leaving this shutter open with a big lens on it, and let's say the sun came directly into this room and it bounced off something over there that was really bright, and this focused that sunlight that was really bright, technically, it could start a fire. Did you ever use a magnifying glass and focus it until it burns something? It's the exact same principle. When you focus the sun, even though it's 93 million miles away, when you focus it to a point, you get all of its energy in one, spe one spec, and that can do some damage. Camera is too hot, your GoPro will turn off automatically. I'm glad to learn what you can and can't do. But now, we just leave this. We just leave it. Um, it's going to be all day. I hope this was really enjoyable to watch. If we have an image that's actually finished, we'll be cutting to it shortly after a time lapse. If we don't have an image at the end of this, we still had fun looking at a cool camera. And I definitely had fun explaining a lot of things that I like to talk about to no one in particular. Now, I'm not saying you're nobody. I'm saying I don't know who I'm explaining it to yet. I hope the internet enjoys it. Let's cut to time lapse. Ah, well, it's been 24 hours. I have not yet showered. That's not a rhyme that's intentional. I'm taking this black light bulb that I set up overnight away, and we're gonna look at the photo that we may or may not have in this camera. Llama, you get to watch too. We've got something! I had no idea if anything was going to come out. There's a llama here. He's not going to last. This is not a very strong exposure. But I'm just so glad that there's something here. There's a llama. Do you see, do you see this llama? He's pretty chill. The llama's pretty chill. I'll take a photo of this digitally, invert it, so we can see what the end result would have looked like if it had been a more permanent image. I'm so glad that we got something out of all this 24 hours. And I hope that you got something out of this roughly half hour. I'm glad that you didn't have to spend 48 times as much uh, of your own real time enjoying this process. But I hope you did enjoy it. Thank you again. This has been so wonderful. I don't know what else to say. Thank you. Oh, and if you want to know what this set is, uh, I'll show you. This set was simply a couple things. A blanket, whoosh, an Ikea board covered in gunk. That's a desktop, I think. It was $15 at Ikea. Two boxes and two stools. That's it. And now it's gone. It's all going away. Because this is my living room and it's time to live again. Until the next time. <laughs>